Um, so thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I've been reading your work with great interest for a few years now. Um, I don't have uh, much background in Celtic other than just a general Indo-Europeanist background and the ability to read the reference work. So I'm very interested to have you to talk to today. And our audience here is full of people who are interested in linguistics either professionally or as very informed amateurs who also don't often have the opportunity to talk to a Celticist. So it's a huge, huge privilege that Professor Dobbin shifted from, is it Maynooth? No, right. Maynooth. Okay. Maynooth. Stress on the second. Maynooth. Yeah. Okay. Maynooth. All right. Or, or rather Maynooth. in the, the Hiberno-English pronunciation, Maynooth. 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 Maynooth University in Ireland, Maynooth. where yeah. you are a professor of Old Irish and, and early Celtic. Yeah. Well, uh, Old Irish, strictly speaking, yeah. Old Irish, okay. Very good. Well, could you... So, so really what I think brings you here today is your professional work on Cisalpine Celtic. So could you talk to us a little bit, set the stage for Celtic languages in say about 500 BC, what are they, where are they spoken, who's using them, what are the, the writing systems? Can you just sort of set that, that stage and give us that, that, that cast of languages? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, uh, to this to this uh, interview. And it's a great pleasure and honor for myself to to be speaking to you and to to all, to to the audience. So I'll try to keep it as as understandable as possible. All right. Um, 500 BC, what Celtic languages are there? Well, if we go for the, the very easy answer here is attested Celtic languages, there's just a single one at that time. And that is, uh, uh, well, what I would call Lepontic or one of the Cisalpine Celtic languages. Obviously, there must have been many, many more uh, languages, uh, Celtic languages around at the time. But uh, at this very early stage, uh, around the middle of the first millennium uh, BC, uh, they did not practice writing yet. But of course, a couple of centuries later, we get writing in the uh, uh, in the Transalpine Gaulish region, i.e., what is more or less today southern France, and then later on uh, all of France, and uh, uh, from uh, the middle of uh, or the center of um, of, of of Spain. Uh, uh, also in the second century BC, and then even later on, we find Celtic languages in the, uh, uh, on, in, in the, on the islands of Britain and Ireland. But 500 BC, the only language that we can actually say something about because we have written evidence that is uh, Lepontic. And even that evidence is, of course, extremely limited, extremely small. Uh, but all the, these other the, sorry, but all these other languages must have already been there, obviously, but well, they, they weren't written yet. I just want to ask a quick question for clarification. Lepontic is an exonym, isn't it? We yes, yes, yes. Uh, like, well, like like almost all of those ancient Celtic uh, language names, uh, these are just modern modern uh, uh, term, uh, terms that, that are being used just for convenience sake. Uh, uh, it's called Lepontic uh, because there is the belief or there has been the belief that uh, the Lepontic people who are known from Roman sources and which uh, lived well in what, what is today uh, southern Switzerland, Canton Ticino, uh, that they were the, uh, the, the, the speakers of that language. Uh, in, in fact, uh, some doubt has been cast on this idea uh, recently, mm. and it may actually be a, a, wrong, a wrong name, but well, we still keep uh, using it. Uh, and, and maybe... It, uh, just to continue on this, uh, beca because of the of the of the prominence of the name Celtic, uh, we must never forget that the word Celtic or for the for the language family for 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 culture etc. is also just a modern exonym. So we have no idea what these people call themselves. Sure, sure. And the nature of our written evidence for Lepontic is mostly very short and, and epigraphic, right? Yes. 
It's exclusively epi epigraphic, uh, and it's extremely short. So uh, it's not to, to, to be to be fair. It's not a very exciting language as lang as ancient languages go. Um, so if we take all of Cisalpine Celtic, which is not only Lepontic but also Cisalpine Gaulish, uh, we have at the moment around 450 or, or something like that uh, inscriptions, and mm -hmm. almost all of them are at best one word of one word length or maybe two words, uh, sometimes even shorter than that, just fragments of words or just a single letter or two letters. And there's just maybe one dozen or two dozen inscriptions that have more than two words. And even those are very short. And looking at LexLep, uh, the, the Lexicon Leponticum online, I noticed that a good number of these inscriptions, there isn't even a particularly convincing reading for. There might be a name or something, um, but then, it seems like sometimes the names don't look that much like maybe Gaulish names from a few centuries later, um, yeah. which I suppose makes it much harder to interpret. Uh, yeah, uh, well, first of all, simply from from a typological comparison with other writing traditions in that area or in the Mediterranean basin, or even more globally speaking, uh, from early periods, we would assume that probably most of the texts that we have simply record names, uh, the names of people. Uh, they just felt as much as much prou pride in, in writing down their names on objects like like we do ourselves these uh, today. Um, sure. And yeah, uh, regarding the other point that you raised, which is actually an interesting point, uh, that when we can read them, they do not necessarily look like uh, Gaulish names that we would know from the later Gaulish period, where we have thousands and thousands of well-attested names from uh, Roman contexts. Um, that already has something to do probably with the very tricky question of differentiating between what I call Lepontic and Cisalpine Gaulish. So, my own hypothesis, my own working hypothesis is, is that this Cisalpine Celtic corpus of around 450 inscriptions belongs to do two different, but probably very closely related languages. Uh, the, 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 big, the big question here is how do we distinguish between the two? First of mm -hmm. all, since the texts are so short that they in many cases don't even allow us to find uh, uh, the necessary criteria to dis differentiate, between them, and even if they are long enough, or even if they contain differentiating criteria, there's there's a debate going on for for years and for decades where uh, how to interpret these criteria, whether they are strong enough to really make a distinction between two languages or not. Now, to return to your question about the names, in my own world view, uh, the question of the names is actually one of the relevant items here, namely. Uh, when we get to those inscriptions that I would call Cisalpine Gaulish, that is uh, part of the Gaulish tradition, which has parallels across the Alps in, in, in France, uh, and which cannot have been earlier in Northern Italy than the, let's say the fourth century or, uh, uh, BC, because we know from historical sources that that's around the time when Gauls invaded from Transalpine Gaul into Cisalpine Gaul. Uh, so when these Gauls come in and when they start writing and, and uh, leave, uh, start leaving their own names, their own uh, markers of possession or whatnot, uh, in, mo in many, many cases, we find names that we know very, very well from Gaul. Okay, so uh, an example that I know very well because it's, uh, it's one that I edited uh, a few years ago is from a, from a cemetery in um, Verona. Uh, we have the, the name Eskingorigos, it's a genitive, so meaning of a person called Eskingorix. Mm -hmm. And Eskingorix is a very, very common, very, very well-known uh, personal name, male personal name uh, from Transalpine Gaul as well, where we find it dozens of times. So, uh, uh, so that's a situation for Cisalpine Gaulish. When we look at those inscriptions that for, let's say, simply chronological reasons, we can define as Lepontic, that is inscriptions before the fourth century and uh, confined to a very, very small region uh, around the, the Northern Italian lakes. 
fundamentally we find names that don't have parallels outside. And I think that's one of those relevant issues that they have a naming tradition of their own, which does not look like Gaulish. And that's one of the criteria that I would apply to actually differentiate. I hope I, this makes I'm, sense. Su I'm surprised at it in a way. I mean, you look at, at the Germanic languages and you have such similar names made of, you know, usually those two elements of, from a particular yeah. set of vocabulary. It's, it's surprising that at this early time, there's already such divergence. Um, you know, I, I wonder if that's from cultural contact uh, with some other group that's influencing how they, they name or, 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 or what. Uh, what, what are Lepontic names like? Are, do, are they formed from native elements or do uh, we know? No, no, I mean, that's, that's one of the bigger problems I'd say that we have that in many cases, we just don't, we're not able to etymologize them. Uh, oh. They're usually, so you, you, you were mentioning those Gaulish and those Germanic, these old Germanic names that came, that usually are compound names and contain two elements uh, and very often belong to the heroic uh, uh, sphere uh, praising a, a warrior, prow martial prowess, and uh, whatnot. And this kind of, of, of naming tradition, of course, is believed to go back to protein European times. Uh, we find the same types of names in, in, in ancient Greece. We find the same types of names in, uh, in ancient India, in, in ancient Persia, et cetera, et cetera. So it looks very much like, like an Indo-European in inheritance. We don't find it in the Lepontic material. Uh, uh, the obvious <laughs> very natural uh, uh, suggestion would then be that, well, they that they gave it up, that for some reason they abandoned this type of naming tradition and uh, adopted names that are, first of all, much shorter. They just seem to contain a single element. Uh, and also naming elements that we can't really connect. In most cases, we can't connect etymologically with known Celtic words. So uh, it, 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 it looks suspiciously like uh, uh, they taking over some, or that they have taken over some some kind of naming tradition from other people in the Alpine region. Well, I mean, to me, that's one of the most fascinating things I've heard about this is what, what's going on with that. Um, it, it does seem like the Alps in the last millennium BC contain numerous different cultures that don't speak related languages. So I suppose they could be interacting with any one of those groups. I mean, you've got Radic, which is probably related to Etruscan, right? Um, and then there's Venetic, which is perhaps Italic, but at least Indo-European. Um, yeah. Trying to think yeah. of what else is around. This Communic, uh, whatever Communic is. Yeah, whatever Communic is, yeah. And, and, and in all likelihood, there must have been other languages uh, that we don't even know anything about. Uh, uh, so there has been this, uh, the idea that there must have been some what they call Alpine Indo-European language in the Alps, uh, which we simply know a little bit about from from place names that survive, uh, but which we don't have any written uh, documentation at all. So yeah, so I, I, I guess there would have been loads and loads of opportunities uh, for the let's say, the ancestors of the uh, Lepontians to interact with other traditions. And yeah, the, a, another uh, tradition uh, that is very close uh, uh, re geographically is, of course, Ligurian, which is probably, an, well, which is pretty certainly a, a, an Indo-European language. But again, very, mm. very shady because we know so little about it. Mm. And may I ask, what is the timeline of Lepontic inscriptions? What, when do they begin? When do they end? Uh, well, traditionally, I would have said that uh, it started at the early 6th century BC, and it kind of peters out uh, in the Augustan period, or at the end of the Augustan period. It's, it's very difficult to, to put a very uh, strict date on that, but, but around that time, uh, it would have, uh, uh, it certainly kind of ends. Uh, mm -hmm. In the, in, a few, in the last few years, uh, there have been a few finds and a few identifications of inscriptions from the, from the very core of um, uh, the Lepontic, what, what do you would call the Lepontic speaking area, which have been dated archaeologically even to the seventh century. And uh, objects with clearly some writing on them, uh, but they're very, very difficult to interpret. 
Uh, also, it's quite clear, quite clearly an early form of even trying to write. Uh, and it's not clear whether they're writing their own names or whether it's something imported, let's say, from, from the Etruscans. So uh, probably they started pretty early, maybe even already in the seventh century. But uh, I'd, I'd say the jury is still out there. Uh, what belongs to the Lepontic corpus stricto sensu and, and uh, what, what might be external there. Well, one thing I'm struck by thinking about the seventh century BC is that's early even in an Etruscan or Latin context. That is just a really early time for people to be writing in the Mediterranean. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's, all, that, that's stunningly early. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I guess that suggests to me, and I, I'd be curious what you think about this, that, that this isn't a peripheral people, that they are interacting quite strongly with, with centers of power like the Etruscans and getting ideas and, and probably trade goods from, from yeah. I'm, I'm assuming, Etruscans. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, they must have interacted with Etruscans, but because the, the writing system, the, the script is clearly Etruscan-influenced, uh, uh, even though and my, my colleague, uh, Corino Salomon, uh, talked to you uh, about this in, in, in one of the uh, one, one of your um, interviews. Uh, it's not completely clear which Etruscan variant of writing the uh, uh, the Lepontians really took over because there are some funny well there's one funny letter in in the in the alphabet uh, uh, that doesn't it, that isn't actually found in North Etruscan anyway uh, marginal or not well I mean if you look at it purely from a geographic point of view I I I, I don't think that you can avoid the idea that they are marginal because they sit really right at the at the southern edge of the Alps and if you go a little bit further than that you're deep in the Alps in, in the wild <laughs> almost the wild north uh, of Italy more or less mm -hmm. so I, I I'd say that they are as 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 far as you can get without going into 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 the most mountainous regions mm -hmm. um one other aspect I would like to stress here is uh when we say oh yeah I mean this is very very early but of course, this very, very early uh, use of writing is confined to an extremely small region, sure. just a few square kilometers, basically, uh, between the between the uh, the North Italian uh, lakes. And uh, the earliest inscriptions are really just on two or three small places, which are very close to each other uh, 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 at one of those uh, uh, lakes. And it's only in the centuries afterwards that it, that it starts to, to spread further. And finally, when the Gauls come in uh, and take over the script, then the, the writing tradition really expands over almost all of northern Italy. So it's, 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 it's something very, very local, uh, uh, like, a, like a local cultural trait almost. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about that writing system? And uh, we, we've mentioned that it's adapted from the Etruscans, most likely. Yeah. Uh, it has certain Etruscan characteristics. For example, uh, I suppose the most diagnostic thing is um, the gamma descended letter being used for a K phoneme, right? So C is uh, K rather than G. Uh, actually, uh, that letter does not exist in the in the Lepontic script. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. No, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's very clear that it is derived from Etruscan writing. Uh, for instance, we, we can see that that uh, from the fact that uh, there is no distinction, prima vista, there's no distinction between voice and voiceless consonants in in that writing system, uh, which is a clearly clear uh, a clear advanced Etruscan trait, uh, uh, and uh, which is actually quite unsuited for uh, for Lepontic. Or for a, for any kind of ancient Celtic language, because uh, ancient Celtic languages, like most of the ancient and European languages, make a very clear distinction between uh, voiced and voiceless consonants. But right, K and like G, global, B and P, D yeah, and T, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, uh, they, there's clearly a phonemic contrast between B and P, and between G and K and D and T. But because they took over writing from from a from a culture or from a language. Uh, where that this distinction didn't exist, uh, they didn't have it in the writing system, which which makes 
reading old, uh, uh, reading these old inscriptions uh, 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 tricky or are or, or or very ambiguous because if you have a sequence of of a few letters, there are two, three, four, five, six different ways how to read them, uh, depending on whether you're in voiceness, uh, voiceness or not. And uh, then you have to kind of figure out what makes most sense. So, so if you, when, you, when you have a very short, short name, for instance, it's almost guesswork uh, what that could have been etymologically. Right. I'm I'm a little bit familiar with how those guessing games play out from reading younger food art because you well, yeah, have to play it. Similar to that, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so so uh, a colleague of mine, um, uh, Joe Eska, uh, uh, called called the the script hypo characterized. That is, mm, uh, true. there there are too too few letters to write the language properly. Sure. And yeah, that's that's absolutely uh, the case here. So, for example, there, uh, just to give you one example for that, uh, one word which occurs more than once in the inscriptions is the word pala, P-A-L-A. -A. So that's how we transliterate it. Okay, uh, but I mean, and, and we know what it means because it recurs on on um, funeral stele. So it's it's it it must be a word for grave or gravestone. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we do not know is whether it's actually Hala with a voiceless b, or whether it's bala with a voiced b. Uh, and sure. depending on which of the two you choose, uh, you get to very different uh, etymological idea, uh, uh, connections. And also the, the, the other thing, of course, is that uh, the script makes no distinction between long and short vowels, which is also something which is important for the language. So it could be pala or it could be pala. Again, we don't know from the script. Or, and it doesn't make any distinction between single and and double uh, consonants. All of which, I mean, it, it makes your job as a as a Celtic much harder. I mean, because yep. you could you can probably find a convincing. I, I would guess, just based on my own experience with Germanic languages, you can probably find a convincing etymology for pala or bala, and then you just have to say, well, <laughs> whichever one is. Uh, the pro the problem with this word is that actually nobody has so far produced uh, a convincing etymology for either of the oh, two sure. regions. So <laughs> that makes sure. the, thing even more com the thing even more complicated. Yeah, it's even more nebulous. I mean, wow, that, that I, I mean, it really gives me an appreciation for how difficult the investigation of this language is. Mm -hmm. And does, does that writing tradition change over time? Do, does it get more characterized or, or do, does the tradition ever really settle on a way to expand itself correctly. Yeah, uh, let me just say something uh, relating to what uh, to the to the previous question, uh, what you said at, 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 at the end that it makes our job very difficult to actually uh, read and interpret these uh, inscriptions. And for that reason, actually, one of our jobs is simply to work on the on the on the on the level of letter, compare letters uh, uh, because. Uh, in, 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 in a sense, letters are the things that we know mo most about in that in that writing tradition. So, uh, does the writing uh, system change over time? A little bit. So, uh, there's certainly uh, some kind of experimentation going on in the very earliest phase, but it kind of consolidates rather early on, and there is a kind of poor writing tradition that extends from the sixth or fifth century until the very end. Uh, with the most important rules being kind of in place. But uh, it, is, it is, in my view, it is very obvious uh, from some kinds of variation that we find in spelling that they must have felt uh, the need to differentiate, for instance, uh, or, or that, they, that they actually felt that lack of distinction between voice and voiceless consonants, and that they did some kind of experimentation to alleviate that lack. Uh, one uh, uh, one possibility was, or one way of, of 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 dealing with that was something that they may have seen from their Venetic neighbors to the east. Uh, in Venetic, uh, which had a similar problem, they also had a, a writing system taken over from the Etruscans, but they very early on uh, made the decision to introduce or to reinterpret signs which they didn't use, they didn't need for other things. Uh, to express a distinction between voiceless and voiced uh, consonants. And something along those lines can sometimes be seen in, in Lepontic as well. For instance, there are two letters for guttural sounds, 
or k or h. Mm. And it seems that sometimes they use one for a g and one for a k, but not very systematically. And occasionally you can see something similar happening with dental sounds or sounds that probably relate uh, express dental dental uh, uh, sounds that they may use the one for a d and the other one for a t but it never gets to the to to the level where this is systematic okay which again makes mm -hmm. our life even worse because sure. the rule that they may have used in one inscription may have been actually put on its head in the next uh, inscription right two two inscribers who might even be a century apart or something yeah both have two letters that might mean two different dentals but they might decide that they mean the opposite yeah. to each other right yeah. yeah i see what you mean yeah is, so is that part of what's is that part of the context behind this use of uh the butterfly like son mm -hmm. uh by some inscribers for a a, a dental stopper yeah. could you talk about that yeah that that's that's one of the things and in a way, it might be one of the most systematic things that they at least have developed at some time during the tradition. All right. Mm. So, um, so uh, they have this particular letter which looks like a butterfly, uh, which is called Sun. And uh, so it's a letter that they uh, took over from the from the Etruscans, and the Etruscan uh, actually had a distinction between two sibilant sounds. Not qu completely clear which sounds these were, s and sh maybe, or something along those lines. In any case, uh, Celtic languages in the ancient Celtic world did not have that distinction. So basically, they had one letter which they used for their own s, for their s, but they really didn't have any immediate use for the for the other one, but they kept it. Uh, however, what they uh, started using it for is uh, a sound which which we call taugalicum. Uh, which is probably some kind of acibulated sound like tss. it's very specific to ancient Celtic languages. And certainly in the earliest inscriptions, it looks as if this sun letter is used for that. But from a specific point of time in this, let's say in the second half of the of the tradition, uh, I've made the observation that sun occurs in inscriptions in positions where we would quite clearly expect B etymologically. And uh, that's that's ultimately as far as I really want to go uh, uh, as a hypothesis. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really want to put anything out there what the precise sound behind it was. It could have been, let's say, a, a linited sound, a V, or it, maybe it was some, some assimilated sound, a Z, or something like that. And maybe that's why they thought that this sound which otherwise stood for voiceless could have been suitable for that it's it's it's, it's very hard to tell uh but uh, uh clearly there is at least a certain group of, of names where the interpretation as d makes perfect sense that includes but, but, the but, place sorry, name. sorry but but at the same time they never gave up using it for for tz at the same time mm. so they so they're f fundamentally using it it looks as if they're fundamentally using it at the same time for tz and for du. So they just have to know which one to pick in a, in a given uh, uh, context. I understand. That's well, and that's related to, as you said, having multiple letters for velars, but disagreeing about which one yeah. to use for which. But but by, I appreciate the caution of what you're saying, uh, that it is sometimes in a position where etymologically we expect D. You know, you're you're not saying it is specifically IPA D or specifically yeah. IPA Anderson. Yeah, I understand. What, I, I appreciate the caution of what you're saying there. So that includes, uh, for example, the the etymon of, of Milan, right? Isn't that yeah. right? So and, and, and that's actually uh, one of the more tricky questions uh, uh, in, in the first place. Uh, that uh, this etymon of, of, of this name of the town of Milan uh, was actually the one that gave me the idea, because uh, uh, Milan goes back to a, uh, the name, the modern name Milan, Milano, in Italian goes back to a Celtic place name Mediolanum, which means middle of the plain, basically. Mm -hmm. So the Medio is actually related to to English mid, etc. 
So Mediolano, so that's a, a, a clear and a very transparent Celtic name, and there's actually other places uh, called that name in the, in the Celtic world, so there's nothing uh, remarkable about that. But the, the remarkable thing is that uh, in a inscription that was actually found in the center of Milan, uh, we find the name of the, of the town spelt, but, uh, and in, in the form Mediolano, ending in O, and all of the letters are precisely written as we would expect it uh, in, 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 in this script, in this Lepontic script, with the one exception of the D, where, in which position we find some. And that was the, the starting point for my, for my own ideas about, uh, about this. Well, the easiest, the easiest uh, solution is that some simply expressed D. Of course, things are not so simple there, because uh, the next sound after the D is, of course, a yod. But medio lano. And it's of course possible. It's conceivable that the y in many in many languages a sequence of the y becomes something like z j or something like that, a kind of a simulated sound. And in, sure. in, in, in fact, this is precisely what happens in Italian. From Latin medius, which is also obviously a related word, uh, we get uh, uh, Italian mezzo with a z. Sure. It may sure. well be that. Uh, it, in this particular name, it actually represents something like that. But sure. having, having said that, it's of course conceivable that there were also different levels of language usage, a kind of a more lento variant where you pronounce or, uh, words and the sounds more carefully, where you said something like mediolano, and a what you called an allegro variant, where you said something like mediolano. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the D was more was more audible, sometimes the z was more audible. And from context, from ambiguous context like this, it could then have been maybe uh, extrapolated and, 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 and spread as a, as a variant of writing D. Because uh, on the other hand, we find names where, it, where, where there's no chance that assimilation could have taken place, but it's uh, okay. still fine in the, in the position of D. Okay, the, the only inscription I have seen a photograph of with the letter is that one of Mediolanum. Mm -hmm. but, so, so it does occur in other contexts, as you said, in oh, yeah, some yeah. personal no, names I mean, I, I mean, I, I, Yeah, so I, I'd say Mediolano is actually not the best example because of this ambiguity there. But in my view, the, the, very, the, 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 the clearest example for some you being used for D is the name, is a name, is a, is a, is a Gaulish name, which we know well from Transalpine Gaul, uh, which there occurs, for instance, in, in Greek and Greek letter inscriptions and Latin inscriptions, uh, and uh, try to pronounce it very carefully now, adgonetios, adgonetios. So it has ad, ad at the beginning, okay? Mm -hmm. And we actually have this name twice in the Cisalpine Celtic uh, corpus, and in both cases, the d is written with some. And I think this oh, is really the, the, the clincher. Sure, sure, sure. And of course, I mean, with your background in Gaulish, that, that I, I wouldn't have recognized that as a common Gaulish name. <laughs> right. But I, I see what you mean. That's, 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 in, that's impressive. I, I, I know um, a few of those names, yeah. So <laughs> I recognize yeah, I'm sure. I them. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'm sure. That's, I mean, and it's, it's such a, to me, it was such an exciting thing to see, of course, because um, I, I don't know, you, you saw some of the interview with, with, uh, Karina Salomon, and, and she made such an excellent point that uh, when people are looking at stories for the to account for the origin of the runes, it's not that none of them are plausible, it's that all of them are plausible to some extent. <laughs> but that made that, that connection so tempting to make mm -hmm. with that runic letter for D. Yeah. Um, I mean, and there are other, of course, Plenty of characteristics in Lepontic that look a lot like Elder Fudak runes. The A letter looks uh, the same as I, I think you could fairly say. Um, um, but of course, can I, no. Can I, can I, sorry, can I say something here? I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure how significant the, 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 the A letter is because this, this shape turns up in other contexts as well. And sometimes, they even, uh, sometimes even in early... Latin inscriptions in that northern region, uh, uh, this shape of, of the letter is used. So it could have could have come even indirectly into into, into runic. Sure. Well, I, I don't I don't mean to. I, 
my, my purpose here isn't to make a case for a Lepontic origin of runes. I was just thinking about other things that you can, you can look at and, and feel tempted by, right? Um, do you have any uh, opinion or take on Lepontic script and runes that you'd care to share? Or is this about the extent of, of well, your that, opinion? That that's a that's really about it because i'm what i'm not okay. what i am not is a runologist so that's not my background sure. and i would not dare to go to go anywhere near that minefield <laughs> uh sure i uh but uh I, I certainly would like to underline a few things that corino said in that interview that for instance and, and uh, i'm not talking about le pontic here in spe specifically but more about the north italic uh, region in, in in general, that there are just a few examples of letters there which we only found find there and in runic. Like for instance, this Camunic P, which is so weird as a as a letter shape. Uh, I I I, ju I just don't see how you can get there from any kind of Latin uh, model alphabet or whatnot, and a few others like that. Um, I mean, the the only other thing that I'm constantly thinking about is of course the time gap. That we have. So uh, Lepontic or the Lepontic script certainly was well alive, I'd say, in the second century BC, and it was still good, alive and kicking in the in the first in the first in the first half of the first century BC. But then, when when well, a lot of political politically important things happened in Rome, uh, they had their repercussions uh, in that region. And basically put the death knell to 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 the usage of those vernacular scripts. So let's say the first century BC is by far the latest possible date where transfer could have occurred between between not only Pontic but all basically all North uh, North Italic uh, uh, writing systems and Runic. Uh, so how does this leave? Where does this leave us with with Germanic? Well, I mean we know that. Germanic tribes were roughly around that region in the late second century BC. I mean, there was there was the Teutoni uh, 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 on the on the on the on the on the journey through half of Europe. Uh, there was the famous Battle of Norea uh, uh, at the end of the second uh, century uh, BC in what is today probably. Corinthia in 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 Austria, in the in the mid more or less in the middle of the of the Alpine region. So I mean there were clearly Celt uh, not Celtic uh, Germanic people. I wouldn't necessarily say tribes, because it makes maybe too much uh, a claim. But there were Germanic people around, moving around, uh, maybe as mercenaries, and they could of course have interacted. Uh, we also have inform archaeological information of early Germanic settlers fairly far to the south in what is would be today modern Bavaria, uh, that region. So again, we're not really that far away. And with the latest uh, finds of very early runic inscriptions, which bring us potentially to the first century AD, the, the, the chronological gap isn't that far anymore. And the uh, and the geographical gap isn't that wide, also. So I'm I'm kind of hopeful that at some stage we'll find the the, the bridge that gaps uh, that bridges the gap between between the, the, those writing systems. I agree. I I would very much like to see it. Uh, I can see it being plausible, but I have not been willing to, you know, to to paint in all of the 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 missing parts. I I I would love to see it. Um, I, I have a question here. Uh, some some people were talking in the chat about the Gaulish name that you mentioned. Could you spell it? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, perhaps in the chat. Yep. Just so they can see it. Well, I spell it how it would have looked like in in standard Gaulish. Ad Ad And I, I well, if you want, I can I can write how we just a little bit more complicated. Technically, how we write it or how we read it or transliterate it in 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 or oh, in, in in the in the yeah in the Lepontic script. So that's one uh, one attestation. 
Yeah, written like this. With the, with, and, and for those who haven't seen this before, the S with an acute represents the San letter, which is butterfly shaped like the, the runic yeah. D. That, 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 that's just a very common convention that we use that specific diacritic to represent San. Going back to, to Greek epigraphy. Um, would you take questions from the audience now? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and I want to be sensitive to your time. How? No, no. You know, like, I have, you, you, I have the whole, tell the us whole evening. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you, you tell us when you're done. <laughs> if we start dragging. Well, when when, when I fall down you. dead, uh, then maybe you could stop. But okay, well, I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, all right, so let me pose you some of the questions that people had already shared ahead of time. No, I, 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 have, uh, I haven't actually read the ones in the chat because I obviously I didn't. Okay, I yeah, if, if, if anyone has brought anything new, uh, mm -hmm. please do just go ahead and, and put that in, into the chat. But the ones that were shared um, on Patreon beforehand. All right, so um, Blake had asked, I think we've actually covered Blake's question. Uh, he said, Celtic strikes me as a really complicated language subfamily. He wanted to know about the relationships between Lepontic, Gaulish, Old Irish, how mutually intelligible these historic Celtic languages would be. Do you, do you have anything additional you might like to say about that? Well, I could, I, you know, I can speak for hours about this if you want to. Uh, <laughs> I won't. Uh, yeah, so that, yeah, that's a, that's in fact a very good question. Uh, and the, complex question, okay? So first of all, I have to stress that the term Celtic does not mean anything specific at all, apart from the fact that it refers to a group of languages that share a small number of sound changes that differentiate it from Proto-European. So that's all that is behind the word Celtic. That's all that it means, okay? So obviously one of the very famous uh, sound changes is the loss of Indo-European P in Celtic. So when we have a uh, uh, language and we find a name that looks fairly uh, uh, Indo-European and, and we can find an Indo-European etymology, but uh, the one thing that we have to assume is that P got lost uh, uh, for that etymology, then, and we find it obviously in, in, in this, this region of Europe, then uh, the suggestion would be very natural to assume that it's Celtic, okay? Um, so may maybe le let's start with, with the, the kind of easiest question first. So would Lepontic, Gaulish, Cisalpine, Celtic on the one hand, and Old Irish, Medieval or Middle, Ke middle um, Welsh, Breton, would they have been mutually intelligible? Oh no, by no means, okay? Uh, they are very, very, very different, okay? So first of all, there is a very strong difference between what I call the old Celtic languages and the new Celtic languages. And uh, there's a very mechanical dividing line between the two, which is around 500 AD or maybe 400, 400 AD, all right? The languages before that are what I call, would call old Celtic languages. What does this mean? Well, I mean, for those of you who, who, have, a, who have an Indo-European background, the easiest way to explain old Celtic languages is that they basically look very much like Indo-European languages, okay? So they have uh, uh, the typical endings of Indo-European languages, and that's really how, for instance, uh, Lepontic was identified as an European language in the first place, that people looked at the endings of the, of the names, which were immediate, well, more or less immediately recognizable as the typical endings of nominative singular os for an ostem or ui, for a dative, or om, for an accusative, or a, for a, for a feminine, and a single, et cetera, et cetera. So very, very straightforward uh, uh, endings, which you also find almost identically in, 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 in Latin, or Greek, or Sanskrit, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, when we go a little bit beyond this very superficial uh, uh, ending business, 
and look, for instance, at, at verbal systems. Now, we, we don't know that much about ancient Celtic verbs because they are not so numerously attested, unfortunately. But where they are attested again, they look very much like kind of standard in European uh, uh, verbs that we would expect, all right? Uh, and also the, the, the syntaxes uh, and how sentences are formed, where we can say anything about that. It all aligns very well with, with other ancient European languages. The story is a completely different one when we get to the insular Celtic languages, to the neo or new Celtic languages after the middle of the first century AD. Uh, the earliest well-attested language uh, uh, from the times, of course, Old Irish, but then later on, we also get those British languages like Welsh and, and Breton, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, something really drastic, massive uh, must have happened in the towards the end of the first half of the first century, a, uh, sorry, first millennium AD, because all the languages in the region, and not, not only the, the, the Celtic languages, but also um, the Germanic languages, for instance, and even, even you could say Latin, underwent massive transformations in their, in their, in their appearance, in their, in their typological makeup. Uh, for, for Old Irish, the most, most consequential changes that happened at the time were that final syllables were lost almost across the board, not completely, but almost across the board, and that uh, uh, middle vowels were very, very often uh, lost by a rule that we call syncope. And uh, that also the, typically the, the pronunciation of the, of, the consonant, uh, of the consonant system, for instance, changed dramatically, all right? So uh, even a speaker of an early stage of Irish, of what we call primitive Irish, let's say the second century AD, and a speaker of early old Irish, let's say sixth century or seventh century AD, they, there would have been no chance of them of communicating because the, dif mm -hmm. uh, the differences between those two stages, it, it's one language. It's, and you can see, you can see the, the, sequential uh, the sequential mutations that, that the language undergoes, but they would not be able to communicate with each other because the languages were so typologically different. And mm -hmm. uh, for somebody who's not an expert in, in language comparison, you wouldn't even be, in most cases, you wouldn't even be able to recognize uh, that a Neo-Celtic language is related to anything like ancient Celtic. So it, 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 it literally took decades at the beginning of Indo-European studies that people actually realized that the Celtic languages or the, the Indian Celtic languages, that they're actually standard Indo-European languages. Right. I I, I think one of the most astonishing things is looking at verbs in Old Irish yep. and seeing these these preverb parts that become the only like half recognizable part of it sometimes. But then there'll be some different mutation in this form versus that form. Um, I think it's the hardest Indo-European language to learn. Uh, um, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, people say that, but on the other hand, uh, ancient Greek with all its dialectal variation and and sure. Sanskrit and Vedic aren't simple either. So, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's up there among the among the top three probably. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you're talking about the, the verbal system here, and of course, uh, uh, that's a very important part of where uh, insular Celtic languages go awry, <laughs> if you want uh, the, the, that word, where they deviate completely from standard in European languages. And where they, where the syntax of the of the language becomes something completely different from what, what we know from from other languages. And that I myself, verb first. I was just going to say that verb first thing is really an insular Celtic feature. Uh, well, that 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 in fact is a difficult question. Oh. Uh, pe 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 people stress that very much, but I think they overstress it. Uh, for, first of all, I mean, it's been pointed out again and again and again that, in fact, verb first position can be found in other European languages as well. I mean, even, even in, in, in my own language, German, uh, we have almost a regular verb first construction in a very, in a, in a, in a, in a very specific type of, 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 of construction, uh, namely when you talk, when you tell jokes. Uh, hmm. Jokes typically start verb initial in German, so that's an that's a very oh. weird, <laughs> very, very weird social linguistic uh, rule, but it is one. Okay, and and 
and also in, in, in Slavic languages, you find quite a lot of uh, sent, uh, uh, verb initial sentences. So no, it's not that, it, as such, it's not that unusual. Uh, and also the, the other problem is, of course, ancient Celtic. We know so little about full sentences in ancient Celtic. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Some of them look more like other Indo-European languages with verbs at the very end or verbs in the middle. And for instance, this alpine, uh, not sorry, uh, what, what I want to say, uh, Celtiberian. Celtiberian, which is the one language where, where we maybe know most about syntax, is actually very archaic in that respect and, and, and really aligns very well with all the other Celtic, uh, sorry, Indo European languages. But uh, in Gaulish, I mean, whenever I look at Gaulish and whenever we find new inscriptions in Gaulish, I have this kind of gut feeling. The more we find of Gaulish, the more it looks like Insular Celtic. And, uh, and the more we find sentences with verbs at the beginning, and even, even in, 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 in uh, Lepontic and Cisalpine Gaulish, uh, the, some of the latest stuff that we found where we have a, more than just a single word where we might have sentences, the, there are some, some of those uh, constructions where, oh God, it, it looks very much like, yeah, we have a verb at the beginning. So it may have actually begun earlier than that. And uh, if the question is, when did it switch so completely to the Indula Celtic system that you have to have the verb at the very beginning? In the ancient Celtic uh, 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 languages, it's clearly a kind of optional thing. It becomes a rule uh, in Insula Celtic. That's the main difference. Interesting. And, and for what it's worth is another data point you see uh, verb first quite often in Old Norse poetry, but it seems to be mostly a poetic construct in, in Old Norse. So. Well, um, it, it's just, just the opposite, of course, in Old Irish. Uh, we have this very, very complicated uh, uh, poetic style uh, called rhetoric or rosk, uh, where we actually find verb final position. So <laughs> you see, okay. it's all very I mean, fluid. Right, and everything is more complicated than the the handbooks yeah. or the or the Wikipedia oh, yeah. articles Absolutely. will make it sound like. Yeah. Um, another question that had come in earlier that I think you've addressed. Morgan had asked about uh, whether the the butterfly sawn letter could represent Tau Gallicum. You said that it 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 does sometimes represent Tau Gallicum, and and she wanted to know about what Tau Gallicum represented. You said uh the, the ts right typically it's uh is what we think or well i mean yeah that's what you think obviously we have no recording so we can only make indirect gotcha. inferences but i'd say something like or some sharp sound maybe a sharp or something like that sharp hissing sound may probably be the best guess mm -hmm. and then as far as other questions that were submitted early i may turn this over for a moment to one person who had a question. So Janet, who is here, had a question about the, some, uh, well, should I put this, can, can I connect you to her? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Janet, I'm, I'm bringing you in. Well, you seem like a sensible person, David, and you've already <laughs> fled screaming from the idea of having opinions on runes. So I'm not certain if you want me to actually address this. Um, I came up with a theory on the uh, resequencing of runes uh, that uh, I, I will tell you, I have no linguistic training or background, but what I was trying to propose was a mechanism to fill the void that Jackson Crawford had made very clear in one of his videos, which is that no one was even attempting to find a methodology by which the alphabet traditional sequence could be changed to a the runic sequence. Um, so I used the similarity, a proposed similarity between the original um, proto-Sionitic reinterpretation of the Egyptian hieroglyphs to as a model for a similar shift between the sequence and the runes. If you've read over the notes, you you have an idea of what I was was trying to say. 
And if you have any insights on that, I would certainly appreciate hearing them. Okay, well, yeah, so I, I, I saw your note and I read it. Uh, and well, first of all, as you said yourself, I'm not a rheumologist, and I certainly have no opinion uh, on this very unusual sequence of letter names. Obviously, there is something weird going on there. Uh, to be honest, I was not very th convinced by your explanation uh, for a for a simple reason, because in order to make it work, we would have to assume. I mean, so first of all, basically, you you need you 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 use Latin as a, as a kind of stepping stone to get to get there. Okay, so basically. Uh, Latin is the model on which the foot arc is then kind of rearranged. But uh, uh, your theory uh, basically presupposes that there were letter names in the in the Latin alphabet, which were then translated or reinterpreted in the in the Germanic tradition. But I, I'd say this is the the weak point in 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 your hypothesis uh, because there is no such thing as these. Uh, Latin letter names that you would require to 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 get uh, to get there. Okay, uh, it, it's it's actually a remarkable uh, uh, thing in in its own right that Latin does not have any le any letter names. Okay, when, uh, obviously Latin alphabet derives ultimately from Greek. Greek derives from uh, Phoenician and and, and, and Semitic uh, script, and uh, there. In, in the in the in the let's say mother uh, script, there are of course letter names which refer to real life to real life nouns uh, usually. Uh, when taken over by the Greeks, the names are being taken over, okay, but they are not translated. Uh, actually, the a word like alpha or beta in, in Greek is found as such meaningless in Greek. It just refers to the letter because of course they no longer understood that alpha referred to a to a to a bull and. and better refer to a house and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but the the more interesting uh, uh, thing, of course, is that when then the Greek alphabet is being passed on to the Etruscans and then further on to the, to, to, to the Romans, uh, these letter names are being lost as well. And they reduce it. There must have been actually an Etruscan thing to do. They reduced it uh, to a plain initial sound followed by a vowel or the other way around. So. A, B, K, e, D, E, F, et cetera, et cetera. There is no meaning associated with those names. And as far as I'm aware, uh, there is no such tradition in, in Latin or in the Roman world to, um, to assign any kind of meaningful words to the letters. The, um, however, a, a, a parallel the parallel is, is, of course, the the Irish Orm alphabet. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, which, and I, I, I mean, we could make a separate video about that, and I don't want to go into any 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 detail. Uh, about sure. this. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's clearly derived from the Latin alphabet. Oh no, no, it's not derived. I mean, that's the wrong word. It's inspired by the Latin alphabet. That's that's very clear. And there is clearly some kind of linguistic thinking behind uh, the arrangement of, of, of letters within the Orgum alphabet. Uh, but again, the order is completely all over the place. Well, I mean, completely all over the place if you look at it from the point of view of Latin, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, a colleague of mine has actually come up with a very clever idea why uh, we have the order as, uh, as we have it. Uh, um, but anyway, from a purely descriptive point of view, the important thing is, like the foot arc, it has a completely different order. Uh, and like the foot arc, uh, there are actually meaningful names or half meaningful names to the Ogham letters. Now that's, yeah, and I, 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 I don't want to go into the, because that's a rabbit hole if we go there. Uh, uh, the question is, um, when did those names arise? And uh, I'm actually have become a rather skeptical fairly recently 
whether this is an old thing in the first place, or okay. at least, or at least, if the names that we nowadays associate with the Ogham alphabet, whether that has, is actually an old tradition, or a, a modern, well, mod, modern in this case meaning seventh century or eighth century, which is modern in in, in Ogham studies. Okay. We wish. Thank you for, for your time, and Janet. Also, thank you very much for writing in with with. I, I thought a very thoughtful take on this. Uh, so this is the kind of of audience that I have here. Like I said, people who think very seriously about language. And, yeah, yeah, no, and, no. Uh, I mean, it, it 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 is an interesting idea, but I don't think it works out. Right, but. It's also very interesting, uh, just, just the question about OM itself. And I think that if you would like to talk about that sometime, we should do it, but we but we should make it probably a separate conversation because I know you've talked absolute, about that absolute, for a absolute, long, yeah. long time. Um, so I'm scrolling back up through the chat, looking for other questions. Are you, are you still right for time? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm all yours. Thank you. If, if anyone has, other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And I may miss some as I'm scrolling back here looking for them. Um, B. Yavorsky had actually asked a question very similar to that about um, about uh, O-M letter names. So we'll, I think we covered that. Um, Andrea asked, when you were talking about the huge change in phonology and syntax between Old Celtic and Neo-Celtic languages, do you have any answer the question of why this change occurred well it's 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 kind of like like corinna's answer in your last interview uh, i i think i have too many answers for that question uh, okay uh, there's too many possible answers but no proof for any uh well i i i have actually a, a, a hypothesis and that's a hypothesis that i hope to be able to pursue uh, in more research in, in, in the coming years. Okay, cool. I think, yeah. I think uh, this very, very radical change that, that occurred, <clears throat> sorry, losing my voice here. Uh, this very, very radical change that occurred in the language is, it smells uh, like what is called in social linguistics, rapid language shift. Uh, which means uh, a huge population shifting from an earlier language, which we don't know what it is, to Celtic, but not mm. properly learning the language, but uh, transferring a lot of their speech habits uh, from their old inherited language onto the new target language. And in that way, the old language dies, and the new language wins out, but actually in that process, the new language is transformed radically and doesn't look like it was before either. And uh, I, I, I do believe that this is probably the best scenario to explain what's going on there. Uh, because of the Ogham inscriptions, we actually know that the changes took place in probably the fifth and early sixth century. So we can date them fairly yeah, and because of Latin loan words, uh, we can date them with quite some uh, confidence to that period. And the other thing that we can say with some confidence is, is that uh, the changes were rapid. I, and, well, rapid means within three generations. Uh, that is maybe within a century or so. That is rapid in, wow. in, in the view, in, 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 from a point of view of, of, ling of linguistic change. Uh, and uh, that is not, let's say, how things would, would evolve on, under normal circumstances. The best scenario is this kind of huge language shift from a huge population uh, to, 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 uh, to Celtic or to a, to a Celtic language, which then basically at the end emerges as Irish. And from what can be seen of, of, of primitive Irish and, and very old OM inscriptions, that's, that must be much more like Gaulish absolutely, and structure yeah, absolutely, and, and yeah, phonology. Absolutely. So the, the, the earliest Ogham inscriptions that we have, they look, well, the earliest Ogham inscriptions are actually still what I call Old Celtic. So Irish in that sense is the only language that straddles Old Celtic and Neo-Celtic. All other Celtic languages that we know 
Celtiberian, uh, Nepontic, uh, Gaulish on the one hand are strictly Old Celtic. Uh, the British Celtic languages like Welsh, Breton, and Cornish, they are strictly Neo-Celtic. Irish is the only one that straddles that, 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 that divide. Uh, with the earliest uh, being clearly Old Celtic, with very, very clearly recognizable endings that look, to all extents and purposes, almost identical to, 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 to Gaulish. Wow. And then this change happens, it sounds like grandparent to grandchild, which is yeah. incredibly yeah. fast. Yeah. I mean, that's just falling down a waterfall of so much. Yeah, yeah. Huh. absolutely. We, we, we definitely need to have a separate chat on Old Irish. Um, you're very welcome. Could, let's 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 talk about the, <laughs> doing that later. Um, Gavin asked, could you speak a moment on the politics of Celtic language origins? Politics of Celtic language origin. Oh my goodness! Uh, you mean the academic politics about this? Uh, well. I'd, I'd say from a linguistic point of view, there is not much politics involved. Uh, people with an Indo-European background and with a, with, a, with a suitable background to actually understand language change and language development and historical uh, phonology, uh, diachronic phonology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the, the basic facts are clear. I mean, we have Indo-European as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ancestor. Then we have a fairly long period of which we know nothing, about 3,000 years or 2,000 years. And uh, then ultimately in the first millennium BC, when we finally get Celtic languages, they are a thing, okay? They are clearly defined, they're cl clearly recognizable. When we find inscriptions in those languages, we can clearly uh, uh, assign them to, to Celtic. Uh, like, like, for instance, happened in the 20th century uh, with Celtiberian, because before the 20th century, we didn't know that Celtiberian existed. It was only discovered in the 20th century, but it was clear from the character of the language when those inscriptions were could be read that it must be Celtic. Okay, uh, and if if uh, God, I mean, it's the one prayer that I might have, we find a new Celtic language at some stage, inscriptions in a new Celtic language. If we find them, uh, we could use the same kind of methodology and could identify them clearly as Celtic. Okay, uh, and of course we could say something about its relationship relative to the other Celtic languages. Uh, so, so that's 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 the easy part. The difficult part, of course, is where exactly did Celtic uh, originate? Ah, yeah. Okay, so I see that that's really the question. Well. Uh, <laughs> um, again, I'd say. There is not much, well, there is a lot of politics there, but not a lot of discussion because uh, most people in the field who work on, 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 on these matters agree that Celtic must have originated on the continent and probably somewhere in Western Europe. Uh, and literally only uh, two weeks ago or so, a book, uh, appeared with an article by myself and uh, uh, by colleagues that is very relevant to that. And actually later this year, or maybe I mean, well, maybe next year, another book will uh, 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 appear where I speak actually much more uh, in much more detail about these questions. Uh, but uh, in that recent article of mine, which appeared, I argue very, very well, I argue uh, I won't comment whether it's convincing or not, <laughs> but I argue that uh, Proto-Celtic was a landlocked language, hmm. uh, uh, which goes diametrically against another very prominent theory of the last two decades or so, so-called Celtic from the West theory, uh, which said that Celtic actually originated at a very early stage in the uh, early Bronze Age, basically, on the uh, uh, on the Western Islands and spread from there to the east into the continent. Uh, from a linguistic point of view, this makes no sense at all. Uh, there are many, many arguments. I won't go into the details, but there are many, many arguments against uh, this assumption. But really, uh, a death blow has been uh, uh, has been given to that hypothesis fundamentally by uh, paleogenetics in the past uh, ten years or so. 
Uh, so paleogenetics is a massively, a massively powerful tool. Uh, uh, and in European uh, linguistics uh, uh, rely now very, very strongly on input from, from, his, uh, from paleogenetics. And certainly what we can see in the paleogenetic record uh, uh, excludes, ex basically excludes any kind of movement from the West to the East, but very, very clearly shows a much later movement from the East to the, to the West. Uh, actually, I don't think that this movement is Celtic, but that's another story for another time. Um, but uh, that's again something that I hope to be able to to pursue in much, much more, much more detail in the coming years, and I hope to to be writing an, a, a big project application together with paleogeneticists to actually uh, uh, to actually make much more in depth research into the into the early Celtic West and what's going on there, both from a genetic and from a, from a linguistic point of view. So Kevin, I don't know, did this, did this answer your, your question? Okay. I, that will be intriguing work to see. Um, uh, B. Yavorsky asked uh, another question, uh, getting into some linguistics, the, the tamesis and verb final stuff in old Irish texts, is that, uh, well, we, we touched on this a little bit, I think, but it, it says, is that an archaism or a poetic innovation not really indicative of earlier stages of the spoken language? Oh, God. If only I knew I'd be famous. So, uh, uh, I don't really have any very pronounced uh, opinion on this, to be, to be quite frank, okay? Uh, uh, for for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, again, the evidence is very very slim, and as the as the question itself reveals, it can be interpreted in two completely diametric in two completely diametrical uh, ways. Uh, it's r remarkable that this feature is basically confined to poetry, or at least rhetorical style, uh, which need not reflect ordinary spoken language in the first place. And some people in the past decades really have made a very strong case that this is actually a, uh, a an emulation of Latin rhetorical style, that they just tried to imitate Latin, Latin word order. Again, I'm not 100% convinced that it works like that, but yeah, I, I yeah, I can't, I, 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 I don't have a, I don't have a, a firm opinion on this, and, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, There's, there are a couple more questions. One I think gets a little, maybe too much into old Irish for today. If we're going to do a follow up on that, if you'd like to say something shortish about this, maybe uh, B. Yavorsky asked. Uh, another question, what is our current idea of the original purpose of Oum? Stone monuments, notes on wooden sticks? Uh, well, uh, uh, well huh. uh, good question. Um, uh, okay, I, I, I can, I, I'll try to be short and I'll address it first of all, purely descriptively. Purely descriptively, the Oum stones are almost certainly mem commemorative monuments. So from that point of view, how it has come down to us, it's clearly a memorial. It does a commemorative if, uh, uh, purpose there, okay? Uh, was it used for other purposes? Well, that's again, question 11, I guess. Uh, um, Unfortunately, we have so little which is not on big stones. Uh, it's literally two dozen objects dating from the fourth to the, I don't know, 10th or 11th century. So 24 objects or 25 objects spread over 700 years almost. So how, how can you build a, a complete theory uh, there? Now, my, my, my colleague uh, with whom I'm working together in the Ogham project, uh, Catherine Forsyth from, from Galway, actually is very firm about the idea that it is used for making notes on sticks. And uh, she, she has practical uh, arguments for that, 
that it's actually very it's it's actually easy to write autumn on sticks. It's actually not easy to write autumn on stones. And the fact that we have almost only stones and very little sticks is just due to chance, but not due to the nature of the script. So I hope this this kind of answers your question or does not answer your question. But but this does seem like something it would take hours to talk about on its own. Yeah, in, yeah. In many ways. Uh, Adil also asked, and this is the last question that I see in the chat right now. Um, do we know why the continental Celtic languages disappeared? What could have caused this? Why are the only extant Celtic languages on the British Isles? Oh yeah, well, that's an easy one. Uh, well, they disappeared because Latin took over. As sure. simple as that. Uh, like, like dozens and hundreds of other languages in the Mediterranean and beyond the Mediterranean basin uh, in the early Middle Ages. It, it, it underwent the same the same fate like 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 loads and loads of other languages and most of those languages we don't even know anything about we were actually lucky in the case of ancient Celtic that we at least know that they existed and we know a little bit about what they looked like but uh, languages let's say in the Balkans there must have been dozens of different languages there we don't know even where when how they were spoken but they we only know that they were that they disappeared under the onslaught of Latin. And then sure. later, onslaught of Germanic people and onslaught of Slavic people, etc. 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 And in, in, in Northern Africa, of course, in the onslaught of Arabic. And and specifically in the case of Lepontic, is there any sign that Lepontic is originally replaced by Gaulish and then Latin? Or does it look like these two communities are separate and both of them are just overwhelmed by Latin? That's actually one of the questions that we try to uh, clarify, or where we hope oh. that we will be able to, that specifically Corina Solomon uh, hopes to find more about this because, yeah, it, it, it's hard to tell. Sometimes in, in some inscriptions, we can see a kind of generational shift. <clears throat> There's this one inscription where we have a man who clearly is a Lepontian because he has a Lepontic name formula, but his wife, as a Gaulish name formula. And his, his family, which probably must mean his children, also use a Gaulish name formula. So this might be an inscription that actually shows us the shift from Lepontic to Gaulish. But it's it's like like all these inscriptions, it's six six words. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't build a, a, a worldview out of this. Okay. Sure. Although people try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, word inscriptions. <laughs> we have to be careful. Um, well, I'd like to ask two questions toward wrapping uh, this up today. One of which is, um, you mentioned a book that you had contributed to recently. Is that the Indo-European Puzzle Revisited? Yes. All right, and is that available already? Yes, uh, well, okay. uh, it's, it's certainly available uh, online. You can buy it online at the moment. I think the official sales as a physical object start in, May, well, it was set to start in summer, July or something like that, but I actually have the physical object already. And okay. I know for sure that my own university already got a physical uh, copy of it. So if okay. you order it, you might get it. I don't know. It's expensive. So, like, it is. Like, so that's the yeah. downside. But it is in press or, or nascently in press. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, actually, I see Thomas is throwing in a question here. If you, if you don't mind, I'll uh, let's see, he says, uh, what is most research regarding Lepontic currently aimed at? Are there popular research topics that keep showing up or is every scholar looking into something different? How many people are looking into Lepontic? Well, I have one hand, I might count them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, maybe maybe a few more. Uh, I mean, first of all, there is no, I, I don't think there's a single full-time Lepontian scholar, okay? okay. Uh, all people who work on Lepontic actually work, really work mainly on different fields. Like myself, my main work is Old Irish and other stuff, okay? Um, or maybe, I mean, maybe Corinna Salomon could be called a full-time uh, Lepontic scholar. She, may, she might be the only one at the moment. She's being actually being paid for that, so yeah, so she might be, uh, at least for a short while. Uh, um, so yeah, so, okay. So the, maybe there are half a dozen or a dozen people who 
seriously engage with 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 that material. But as I said, not most of them not full time, but 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 uh, on and off. And uh, overarching research, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, it's not. It's not. It's not that those I don't know dozen people or so that we regularly meet and say, "Oh, you do this." And well, actually, we we had a we had a conference last last June. Uh, this was the first such meeting ever. So, uh, and th th this was my first meeting with most of the other uh, context scholars ever. So. Uh, no, so basically everybody's doing his own little stuff, and uh, basically we're all hoping, we all agree in the hope that we'll find more inscriptions at some stage. Sure. Uh, this is, I think, a short question. Everything, so. this, uh, I think it's a short question. Be uh, uh, again. It, the, the the word pala, if, if it is pala that you mm -hmm. mentioned on on Grayson's, if that's a voiceless p, would that be inherit? It, it couldn't be inherited pi. Put in your PNP, right? Would, would that be the qua change to a P? Uh, that's an Andrew. That's a, that's actually an interesting point uh, because it has actually been in, uh, interpreted as an inherited P. Uh, huh. Obviously, obviously, the the uh, the corollary of, of of that would be that P had not yet disappeared in 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 Lepontic. Uh, that's, for instance, something that I would not subscribe to. Okay, so I, mm -hmm. I, I uh, and 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 there are actually uh, good examples. Well. More or less good examples that show that P had already been lost in in Lepontic, right? Uh, I mean, in European P had already been lost in Lepontic. So that for that reason, I do not actually subscribe to that idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, the idea if it is voiceless, of course, the one inherited source would be an Indo-European Q becoming P. We know that this happened. We at least have one word in well, probably Lepontic. Uh, that clearly shows this change, uh, but uh, again, it doesn't actually lead us anywhere, or at least doesn't lead us anywhere useful because that would give us an Indo-European or a pre-Celtic reconstruction of qual. But what is that from an Indo-European point of view? I mean, there's no suitable route to connect it with. So, yeah, I don't know. It, it might just as well be a loan word. Uh, we always have to uh, play with this uh, with this possibility, okay? And uh, I mean, to return to what uh, what we were discussing at the very beginning of this interview, uh, I suggested that maybe the naming system, the Lepontic naming system, is due to loan connections with other uh, Alpine uh, people uh, in prehistory, and uh, we clearly have. Well, I mean, clearly. Uh, what is clear uh, in all this, but we have one uh, uh, piece of information uh, that uh, points to loan, loan relationships because it, uh, typically the Lepontic patronymic suffix is al. So it, uh, we, you, you add the suffix al to a name and turn it into a, into a patronymic. Uh, and at least from traditional point of view, this has no parallel anywhere else in. Celtic or in Indo European. Uh, and it looks very much like uh, like the ending al that we know is an is a genitive marker in Etruscan or Retic. So <laughs> may have been, so that, that would actually be positive evidence for lonely relationships. Sure. Well that's that's very very compelling. We need more inscription. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, Morgan asked a question. I think probably the answer is is I don't know, but is it possible, or do we have any reason to think that the Gauls might have named their letters? Uh, I don't think we have any evidence for that. I don't think so. Uh, no, we, do, I, 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 we, we have no evidence to be to be quite sure. I mean, uh, uh, it's the Gauls, and I'm not speaking about the Pontians here or Sicilian Gauls, but Gauls. Uh, they used uh, the Greek letters, and they may have simply taken on, on over the, the the Greek names for the letters when they were writing their own language. And after after the conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar, of course, basically all of Gaul switched to to the Latin script. And by all 
where all accounts what we can expect is that they simply used the Latin names, A, B, P, D, et cetera, et cetera. All right, well, so I thought I would wrap this up by just asking for those of us interested in learning more about continental Celtic languages, could you recommend any readings in, in Gaulish or another in continental Celtic more broadly? Yeah, well, um, there isn't actually any, any one handbook that tells you all, and specifically not in English. Uh, the situation has improved a little bit in the last few years uh, um, with uh, these this small booklets. I know that uh, Corinna already showed them uh, before. That's right. That's from right. the ELO series, uh, where short, the, all, all of these booklets have 44 pages because they're very compact. Uh, they, are, they are written actually for an informed audience. So they're not for the complete, well, I don't want to say ignorance, but 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 people with no background at all. But uh, 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 but uh, for a little, with a little bit of background in in basic uh, basic terminology of linguistics and epigraphy, etc., you, you do very well. And for all of the ancient old Celtic languages, there is one of those booklets. There's one for Celtiberian. There's one uh, for Gaulish by my colleagues Alex Mulland, Pulin Ruiz Davas. And then there are, there's one for uh, Cisalpine Celtic. So uh, I'm, I'm actually showing you the Italian translation because I don't have the English, any, a copy of the English myself at the moment anymore, uh, which I wrote myself. And I also wrote another one about Ogham, uh, oh. I have in English. Um, and they are actually very, very cheap. So you can, uh, yeah, uh, you can easily order them. I'd say via, via Amazon should be no problem, and they don't cost a lot. Um, so that they offer the best introduction at the moment. And specifically on the last page of the last two pages, they usually have a very, very good further reading section, which gives you the base uh, literature. Uh, apart from that, you would really have to go beyond English. So for Gaulish, we have La Langue Gauloise by uh, Pierre-Yves Lambert. Um, uh, for uh, Celtiberian, we have Lengue Epigraphia, Epigraphia Celtiberica uh, by, um, uh, by Carlos Juan Colera. Uh, ah, yeah, and, and uh, one other uh, good overview is in this uh, Palio Hispanica volume. And again, I saw that Corina already showed that uh, the last mm -hmm. time, uh, which has chapters very similar to those booklets uh, about those languages but a little bit more academic uh, altogether. So that, that's really it. I mean, unfortunately there isn't more. I know, and it's something that I've been thinking of for literally for decades now that I said, well, if I ever had the time and wrote a, an introduction into ancient Celtic and English, that would be a bestseller and I'd become famous. But the problem is I have so many other things on my plate that I just don't find the time for that. Sure, but if you ever do it, I mean, I think you have, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I know in my audience, there's a few thousand people who would read that. I know, I, I know so. and, and see, the funny thing is, I'm, but, uh, by profession, I'm, I'm a professor of old Irish, and that's really what I'm doing right. at the time. Uh, but when I see what people cite, and uh, uh, if I follow on, on, on various websites, what people, what articles people are reading, most people are actually reading my, my ancient Celtic stuff, not my, my old Irish stuff. So, yeah, I know. But... And, and and as far as Old Irish, I, I have Tournason's grammar, which I've always thought was good. It is. Um, it is do, you, yeah. do you prefer another one? or No. No, okay. because uh, at the moment there isn't any other one. Uh, that is one of the things that are down the line for me. Uh, one, of, one of my dreams may be to write a new grammar of Old Irish at some stage. Oh. I, I have already written three grammars of Old Irish, uh, or grammar-like uh, things of Old Irish, but they're all rather compact and concise. Uh, 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 and one of them will actually only appear probably next, next year in print. Uh, oh. Kind of typological grammar of Old Irish together with a colleague, Aaron Griffith. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if I if I live to see it, I would like to, to write a full grammar, a new full grammar of Old Irish at some stage. Oh, I hope I live to read it. I, I'd, I'd like to see that. Thank, thank you so much. And and thank you very much also for ending with some some really good 
uh, reading recommendations that are easy to get because sometimes these easy, but the re sometimes the really good reading recommendations are not easy to get. <laughs> so, no, they, they um, should be. It was a great pleasure. Yeah. I, must, I thank you for for the invitation. Oh, well, huge pleasure for me. One of I think our most fascinating interviews, and actually one of our best attended, uh, in spite of all the Zoom problems. So thank you so much for your time, Professor Shifter, and thank you everyone for coming. And for now, I'll wish everyone all the best. All the best and have a good weekend.